Okay, everybody is ready. My name is Ides de Bruyne. I'm a managing director of, of a Journalism Fund based in Belgium. What it's all about here today, it's about the interview. And the interview is one of the most important tools we as journalists have to obtain information, to expand on information we find from other sources and to clarify facts and see things from different perspectives. Unfortunately, too many journalists believe interviewing is simply a matter of asking questions and taking down the responses. Often we pay little attention to these key skills. But to be a truly effective journalist requires that we hone our interviewing skills to an art. This session will offer tips and guidelines from two of the best in the business. They are both the Pulitzer Prize winners and I introduce both immediately. One is the first speaker is Cheryl Thompson. She is a vice president of IRE, the Investigative Reporters and Editors, and an associated professor of journalism at George Washington University, who writes investigative stories for the Washington Post. And the second speaker, we have only two speakers, because they know so much that we need the time and space, is Mark, Sch Mark Schoofs. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Mark Schoof is a BuzzFeed News Investigations and Projects Editor. He was previously a senior editor at ProPublica, the non-profit investigation reporting organization. So this is short. If they want to add some more about their, the stories of their life, it's up to them. Please, I give now the floor to Cheryl Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Edis. Oh, can everybody hear me? Yes, perfect. Welcome. You guys came back after lunch. That's good. That's a good sign. So, we, of course, we want to talk about interviewing. And, and let me say up front that I have tip sheets, um, handouts, actually paper, because that's who we are. Um, and if, you, if we run out or you don't get one, it'll be online as well. Um, so knowing how to conduct an interview takes skill right, and a little luck. First, you have to land the interview. Then you have to ask just the right questions at the right time. You have to ask um, tough questions at the beginning. If you do, or I should say you shouldn't ask tough questions at the beginning, because if you do, what happens? Your interview is probably doomed, right? You save those tough questions for later. And if you don't prepare by researching your topic, you are doomed. So interviewing is one of those things you will get better at the more you do it. I promise you that. When Jeff Lean, the investigations editor at the Washington Post, said that he wanted to do a series on guns, he asked me to find out how many police officers around the country had been killed by them over a 10-year period, and he wanted me to trace the guns to see where they came from. Initially, when he asked me to do it, I thought, oh, okay, find out how many cops, that's easy, and then he said, trace the guns. Not so much, not so easy. What that meant, besides obtaining documents and building a database of all the officers, I had to track down and interview hundreds of people, police chiefs, lawyers, cops, family members. But I wanted to take this to another level. And because I want, this was a series that hadn't been done before, because Jeff is that kind of brilliant kind of guy. Um, and so I wanted something that would elevate the series. So I decided to try for an interview with a cop killer. It's rare that they talk for a variety of reasons, but I was determined to find one and convince him to talk to me. After examining thousands of pages of police reports, court records, and other documents, I found a case that interests me. It was a case of a 19-year-old Chicago man who had been convicted of killing an officer in a neighboring state just before dawn one December. The man, Daryl Jeter, was on probation for a drug conviction when he stole a car and crossed state lines to visit a girl at 4 in the morning. Who visits a girl at 4 in the morning? But hey, who am I to judge? One of the tires on the car blew, and he pulled off the road. A trucker who saw him thought he was a motorist in distress and called 911, which is our emergency system in the US. And that's when chaos erupted. Trooper Scott Patrick heard the call and went to the scene. When Jeter saw him, he thought Patrick was going to arrest him for violating his parole. Jeter panicked. 
Patrick approached him and Jeter shot him and tried to commandeer the 18-wheeler truck before being arrested. Patrick died at the hospital. His wife was three months pregnant with their first child. So what did I do? I read transcripts from the trial and thought it was fascinating. Jeter was found guilty, sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. During his trial, he never told authorities where he got the gun. I wanted to talk to him about that gun. I was determined to find out where the gun came from. But the question was, would he talk to me? And how would I get to him? There was nothing in it for him. He wasn't going to get out of prison. Never, ever, no chance of parole. So how would I convince him to talk? I had to connect with him somehow. So what did I do? What did I do? Anybody? Shout it out. What did I do? I did eventually. Nobody? I wrote him a letter. I wrote him a letter. It's, I know it's kind of hard to see, but I, I wrote him a letter. I told him that I, too, was from the south side of Chicago. What did that signal to him? It signaled that we sort of had something in common. I told him that I wanted to understand him and what he went through. I call it establishing a rapport, right? It also told him if, if you know anything about Chicago and the South Side, chances are if I throw that out that I look like Jeter. I'm an African-American woman, right? Because I wanted him to be able to connect with me. And that's what we do. We try to establish a rapport when we're trying to get an interview with people. A couple of weeks after sending that letter, I got a call from a prison official who said that she was stunned that he wanted to sit down with me. So my photographer, vide videographer, and I went to the prison. So that interview actually, um, thanks to the videographer, um, won an Emmy, won me an Emmy, won the videographer an Emmy. Um, but it almost didn't happen, right? Even though that letter I wrote, got me in the prison door. Jeter decided when we got there, the prison was on lockdown, which meant every inmate was shackled. Hands, ankles, couldn't move freely. And Jeter decided he didn't want to do the interview. Well, <laughs> I wasn't having it because I came all the way from Washington to Indiana. And so I knew I wasn't going to leave without talking to him because that's what we do as journalists, right? We're going to get the interview. And so I asked the warden if I could have five minutes with him, just five minutes. Just take me back. Let me have five minutes with him. And the warden said, okay. So they took me back to a holding area where Jeter was, and I talked to him in a way that I knew he would understood, understand. It included a little slang. It included a few words that he would know and understand. And he eventually told me he didn't want to do the interview because he didn't want to be seen on video with his hands and feet shackled. He was a guy who killed a cop, but he cared about his image. He cared about what people thought, right? He wanted to make a good a first impression, he said. So I promised him that we would not show the cuffs and his face during the interview, which is why it's from here up. Right? And so he agreed to sit with me. And he also told me where he got the gun. He got it from a guy on the street, which means it was probably stolen. And I ended up tracking the gun so I knew where it came from. So interviewing can be tricky, but it's, you know, again, it's one of those things you will master the more you do it. But there, you know, every situation is different. Jeter's situation is different from another interview I might do. But there is one constant, and that is you want to be prepared. Right? You want to be prepared for an interview. I call it strategy. That means going into an interview knowing what information you hope to get. With Jeter, my strategy was for him to tell me where he got the gun. I also find a commonality or something that helps the person feel comfortable talking to you if you can. I call that establishing rapport. With Jeter, the south side of Chicago connection, I could empathize with his circumstances and how he grew up. Even though I didn't grow up that way, I knew people who did. Strategy also means knowing what concerns the person you're interviewing may have about talking to you and how you're going to diffuse them. 
You also need a ready answer when the subject asks what the story is about without compromising your investigation. I once spent two years reporting a series about doctors who had drug and alcohol problems and were repeatedly disciplined by medical boards. Did I say two years? We don't even do two-year investigations anymore, but we did then. And they moved from state to state without uh, their past kept catching up with them. I had to track their moves and then confront them about their reasons for moving. Most of them had illegal drug addictions, though a few were bad with a scalpel. There was one particular doctor who had moved from Maryland to California and then to Arizona. He was a pediatric cardiologist who had a serious drug problem. Tracking him down wasn't easy. I had to contact the hospital where he once worked and convince someone to tell me where he was. Sometimes if you call a place and you don't get any help from the person, wait a while, call back, you may get a different person who's willing to help you. Because he had been relieved of his duties at several hospitals, no one was sure where he landed. But I found his ex-wife, and the operative word was ex. And she was more than happy to tell me where to find him. So, and she gave me his home number. So I called several times without success, and I never leave a message, right? Never leave a message. Or if you're going to leave a message and you want an interview with someone, give them the bare, the bare basics of what you want. Tell them who you are. Tell them you're from and you're writing a story. But don't say what about. Just say, hey, I'm calling about a story I'm writing for the Washington Post or the New York Times or, you know, whatever. Curiosity is probably going to get them to call you back, right? Because they're thinking, what does the Washington Post want with me? Right? And finally, I called again, and I did leave that little message, um, and, he, and he called me back. And when he did, I told him what the story was about and asked him why he had been fired from that particular hospital. Oh, and I also let him know that I knew about his drug problem. We chatted for more than an hour with several follow-up phone calls. When you get a subject on the phone, if you're interviewing them in person, which I prefer to do, because it's so much easier for someone to hang up the phone on you than to slam a door in your face, right? It's just harder for people to do that. But it's important to have your questions written down. I write down all my questions. And to be thorough, because it may be the one chance you get um, to, to interview them. And, and again, never lead the interview with the toughest question like, so why'd you take the money, right? It will put your subject on the defensive, and I guarantee you they will shut down and you'll get nothing. So last year, while working on a story on witnesses um, who were killed, two years ago actually, were killed because they snitched to police, I found a case of a man, Carl Lackle, who was gunned down in Baltimore because he saw a man kill someone and told the police what he saw. The suspect had friends pretend that they wanted to buy this man's car that was for sale in the front yard. They called him and told him to meet them outside, and when he came outside, they said, wave to us so that we know you're the person. He did, and a young man sitting in the back of the car pulled out a gun and shot Lackle several times as his girlfriend's 11-year-old daughter watched in horror. This was a story that demanded at least one video interview, so I contacted the victim's mother, who was so grief-stricken that I knew she wouldn't talk. I convinced her to go on camera, telling her that perhaps she could help others by sharing her story. And that's really important to do sometimes, is to let them know, look, you, you can help so many people if you just tell this story. And also, people sometimes just like to, to get it out of their system, so they're happy to talk. Asking your subject to tell me what happened, and then, and then what happened, and then what happened after that, it's a great way to get people talking. Asking open-ended questions encourages conversation. So there's, you know, there's usually a backstory with a story, right? So the backstory here was Mrs. Shipley. Um, by the way, before I tell you the backstory, what did I, what did I want to get from this interview with her, a video interview? What was it that I was hoping to get out of this? In the back. Can you talk? Emotion. 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 Absolutely. That's exactly what I want. I wanted her anger and her grief to come through. And did it? Yes. It did. So because it came, here's, here's how I, well, the backstory. So we went, 
shot her, she was easy, she agreed to the interview right away, but what you didn't see in this is behind her head, when, when Michael Ducio, who was an amazing photographer, three-time Pulitzer winner at the Post, who, um, who actually had a massive heart attack and died covering the Ebola um, crisis in Liberia, um, he shot this, and in the background, her husband was walking back and forth. We didn't realize until we got back to the newsroom and the video. And here he is going back and forth, and it's so distracting. And so we had to go back. Well, Michael had gone off to Liberia by then, and so we had to go back. So then I had to call her again and say, do you mind if we come back and shoot this? So then I had to get her to have that same emotion the second time. And I wasn't sure that she would, but she did. So, you know, lesson there is make sure nobody's pacing behind you in the video. Um, but, but I took her back to that day when she lost her only son. You know, how did you learn? The questions I asked, how did you learn that Carl had been shot? What did you do when you heard about it? What did you think? What were your emotions? What went through your mind? You know, it must have been agonizing. Right, and the information just poured from her. And so those are the kinds of questions, you know, in situations like that that you wanna ask. But sometimes though, you deal with reluctant subjects, which can be tricky even for the most seasoned journalist. Um, several years ago, I began investigating a politician in Maryland. And while reporting the first story, where I learned that he was giving job contracts to his friends, um, timing was everything when it came to interviewing him. And the questions you should always ask yourself is, when is it safe to interview the person you're investigating? Right? Often we want to wait until we're close to publication uh, to ask those confrontational questions, but for, I don't, for a lot of reasons. One, it's really not fair to the person, and it's all about fairness. I, I do the confrontational interviews once I have the documents and the information I need to feel comfortable um, to know that the person can't thwart the story. It's also important to build trust, right? Um, sometimes it's not possible, but, but often it is. I just literally finished a story for the cover of the Washington Post Sunday Magazine before I came here about unsolved murders in DC. And it took several phone calls to relatives to convince some of them to talk to me. Um, often as journalists, we feel like we're harassing people, right? When we wanna go for that interview, it's like call them and call them. Um, but, but I call it being persistent, right? Being persistent. And persistence usually pays off. So, and another key to successful interviewing is knowing when to talk and when not to. We all like to show people how smart we are, but listening is one of the greatest attributes you can have as a journalist. Legendary Post reporter Bob Woodward, um, who along with Carl Bernstein, of course, broke the Watergate uh, story that forced the resignation of President Richard Nixon in the 70s, once told me to let the silence suck out the truth. Let the silence suck out the truth. I think he got that from the CIA, actually. Um, he told of the story when he went to an army general's home and knocked on the door. And when the, I mean, he literally like, and the general opens the door, and there's Bob Woodward standing there. Now, my thing is, unless you're having a party and you've invited Bob Woodward to your house to open the door and see him standing there could not be a good sign. <laughs> not a good sign. And so, Bob just stands there. The general opens the door and Bob's just standing there. And what do you think he said? What do you think anybody said? I didn't do it. <laughs> nope. Bob said nothing. That silence. He said absolutely nothing. And there were a few minutes of awkward silence. And when there's awkward silence, somebody's going to say something. And Bob knows how to keep his mouth shut. He actually has an eight-second rule. He pinches his hand for eight seconds to, not, to remind himself not to say anything. And finally, the general says, and these are his exact words, the general looks at Bob and says, are you still doing this shit? <laughs> and Bob says nothing. He just stands there. And the general finally says, fine, come on in. He goes in, he gets the interview, he goes about his business. That's why he's Bob Woodward, right? But it's also why you go and do interviews in person rather than on the phone, right? Because the general probably would have hung up on him, but it is harder for someone to shut the door in your face. So it was brilliant, and Bob is brilliant, and I will turn it over to Edith 
who will turn it over to Mark. Thank you, guys. Okay. Before we ask questions, you want a question? Uh, otherwise, we wait. You can write. It's one of the tips was write your questions down. So I would ask to write them down and wait for your, thorough, for your strong questions uh, until the end. Okay. And, uh, we, and you will get uh, some extra tips now of uh, David. David, it's now your turn. Okay. And then all the questions, you can write them down now. So we'll come at the end. Thank you very much for that introduction. Just a slight correction, my name is Mark, not David. <laughs> but, um, um, so, first of all, that was amazing, Cheryl, and thank you very much. The things that I really, that she said that really resonated with me were to not leave a message, or if you do leave a message, don't say what the story is, because that curiosity trick is absolutely right and works an amazing proportion of the time. Um, and the whole idea of silence, just, it's so awkward if someone just doesn't say anything. You see my point. All right, so um, I thought it might be useful to just say a little bit, because I always like to know about people before uh, I talk with them, it might be just useful to have a little bit of information about me. I got my start in journalism, not through journalism, but through activism. I'm a gay man. I came of age at the time that the AIDS crisis was in its worst, and there was no uh, drugs for it. And so I started out as an activist, and I ended up editing a gay and lesbian news weekly in the city of Chicago, and I found that I really loved journalism. And I kind of didn't have any real mentors until I got to the Village Voice where I had a terrific editor and then I went on to various other places. And now I'm at a place called BuzzFeed News. And since many people don't know what BuzzFeed is because we're only six years old as a news organization, we're a little toddler compared to the hundred and something year old Washington Post, uh, I thought I'd just quickly say that we are a news and entertainment company we're one of the largest sites on the web. We, have, we employ about 300 journalists worldwide. Um, and we have BuzzFeeds that are not only in the US. We have BuzzFeeds that are of, by, and for different countries, India, Japan, Brazil, uh, Germany, the UK, Australia, and so on and so forth. And these are not outposts of the US. They are uh, run by and they are for the cultures in which they, they are. And on the investigative team, which I run, uh, and there's about 20 uh, people on three continents, Australia, the United States, where most of, of my folks are, and in Great Britain, we are you know, looking for global stories. And more and more, we're looking for global stories. So we did one on match fixing in tennis that was a huge hit and caused tennis to kind of reevaluate what they're doing. We did a wonderful story on something that a lot of people from the developing world will know about called ISDS, which is a court, basically, in which private companies can sue governments for decisions that governments make in their own country and win hundreds of millions of dollars. We've also done work on Russian assassinations and arms dealing and global money laundering. So if you have a great idea, we rarely partner, but we sometimes partner. And if you have a great idea for a global story, come talk with me. Um, so in an interview, what is your first and most important task? To listen. That's good. But there's one other thing I would say even before listening. Anybody else got an option here? Ask questions? So that's good, finding the right person. I'm, I'm, you're actually going back even before where I was thinking of. What I think your job is to do is to get the person talking. If they don't talk, they can't answer any of your questions. The most important thing is not your list of questions. The most important thing is what Cheryl talked about. Interviewing is a human interaction. Almost, you don't have the power of subpoena. And unless you're really unethical, you don't waterboard people. So you've got to like convince them to talk with you. It's a human interaction. And if you take away nothing else from what I have to say today, 
it's not about you and your questions. It's about the person that you are talking to. And whatever you can get them to talk about is the single most interesting thing you have ever heard in your life. No matter what it is. Because it's a human interaction and it's not about you, it's about them. I really hate to go into an interview where I know nothing about the person. That happens, we can talk about it, but I want to know as much as I can before I interview someone. Sometimes I'll just go drive by their house to get a sense of their aesthetic. I'll go to their place of work without letting them know that I'm there to get a sense of who they are and where they work. Who is this person? Is it the ex-spouse? They are the best. <laughs> Is it a disgruntled employee? They are the second best. Someone wronged? Or is it a perpetrator who's the hardest person to get to talk? Do you know or do you think you know what information this person has or are you kind of flying blind? Maybe this person has information, maybe they don't. And of course, the most important thing, what could motivate this person to talk? Maybe it's because they hate their ex-spouse. Sometimes, believe it or not, it's because people want to do something for some higher purpose. That does happen. But you need to figure out as best as you can before you meet what are the likely motivations. So there are some guidelines. These are not universal. These things differ massively from culture to culture and from person to person, but here are some some thoughts. First of all, be honest. You don't necessarily have to say everything you know, but don't tell something, that, don't say something that is untrue. And that's especially important now when the media is hated, and it is hated by many millions of people around the world, and it is profoundly distrusted. And anything you can do to counter that is good. Sometimes, you know, it's not a bad idea to say, may I interview you, and you can have the tape. That's so disarming. Like, they, the, the trust that you can build with something like that is amazing. Because the person said it. You're not giving them something they don't have. You lose nothing. Right? But you build trust. Identify yourself as a reporter. I know there are people who do undercover reporting. That's a different kettle of fish, but if you're not doing undercover reporting, identify yourself as a reporter. Protect your sources. I won't go into this deeply, except to say, think very, very deeply about whether you are really and truly willing to go to prison to protect a source. You might have children. You might have grandparents who depend on you or parents who depend on you. Are you really willing to go to prison? And if you're not, don't tell someone that you will. Think deeply about that. Be polite, in my experience, maybe because I'm just too cowardly or something, but threats never work in my experience, or have almost never worked. Um, and be entertaining. They don't have to talk with you. I sat next to a, 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 a reporter, Lori Cohen, at the Wall Street Journal, who was the best flirt on the phone I have ever heard in my life. And I am so envious of her ability to do that. I can't do that. I had to find other ways to be entertaining. And you need to think about who you are and what sort of ways you can use to get people to talk with you and to keep them talking. But think about, you know, why someone would keep talking to you. And finally, one's on here that I, one's not on here that I think is the most, maybe the most important guideline. If the person, if you ask the person, may I, you know, may I talk to you, or however you start to initiate the, the conversation, and they start talking to you, or they say yes, or whatever, man, I even, shouldn't even be called work. Like, that is the easiest thing ever. Because most people will say no. So have an answer ready for when they say no. Have a, a next strategy and quite frankly, have a second and a third strategy. Because reporting begins when the source says no. Okay, 
I probably won't have time to go through all of these, but I'll, and I'm going to short the first one, the vulnerable source, because Cheryl did such an amazing job of talking about that. Um, a vulnerable source is somebody, for example, who just lost their son, who is not particularly media savvy, who doesn't, you know, not hold some powerful position like a CEO or a senator or, a, you know, something like that. Um, it could be someone who's poor, very, very poor, uneducated, and doesn't understand what it means to talk to the media. That's the kind of thing. In those situations, now you can't do this with someone in prison, but in those situations, I like to try to meet the person where they're comfortable, wherever they're comfortable. It might be in their home, it might be something else. I like to ask them if they have questions for me, because they probably do. And I ex try to explain the process, because it's not just this interview. You're going to have to corroborate what they said. Let's say you're doing a story about sexual harassment or rape, right? So you're talking to a victim or a survivor of a rape. Now, because you're a journalist, you're going to have to go and corroborate what that person tells you. And I think that that person who talks to you has a right to know that. And they, have, they can, can understand what your process of corroboration will be so that they can make an informed decision about whether to speak with you. And, you know, I did a lot of reporting uh, here in Sub-Saharan Africa, and people did not necessarily know who could see the story. They thought, well, this is some American. It'll never get back to South Africa or Kenya or, you know, Lagos or whatever. But I had to say, well, you know, because of the World Wide Web, this story might get to your community. So, and then how you will protect them. They may not know what off the record means. They may not know the difference between off the record and not for attribution, all of those things. And don't promise that the story will help them personally because it might not. And that's really something that you can't promise. You can promise to tell their story fairly. You can say you think it might do good in the world, but to sort of promise them that it will help them personally, I, I just, I, I don't like to do that. Um, and finally, be patient. Like, you know, they, they're very vulnerable. They may be traumatized. Give them some time. They may say no at first, but they also may come around as they think about it. Okay, a powerful source. We're investigative reporters, right? A lot of the people who we need information from are people who are powerful. They're the opposite of the vulnerable source. They're very savvy. They know all of our tricks. Well, hopefully not all but many of our tricks, most of our tricks. Um, and you need to get them to talk in many cases. So you don't have to explain the process to these people. They know how it works. They know if you say, if, if the minute I say I'm a reporter, it's on the record unless they tell me otherwise. Um, and if they ask for something to be on the record, push back. Like ask them why, you know, and you know, Shame them a little bit. Do you not have the courage of your convictions? I mean, you know, you can, you can push back. If they insist, then define. Because off the record can mean you cannot even use this when you go reporting to other people. Or it can just mean I won't, use, I won't identify you in the story. So start there. and Define it as, okay, I won't identify you in the story. Again, play to their interest. We've already talked about this, so I don't need to go on to it. And then... The competent is, is, is an interesting one because I love to play dumb, often because I legitimately am dumb, and it can be an incredibly powerful tool. Alex Friedman, one of the greatest investigative journalists in the United States, just did that so unbelievably well when she did the story that she won the Pulitzer Prize for, for um, tobacco, one of two Pulitzers that she won. She asked a cigarette executive, what's a cigarette exactly? That was her first question. What's a cigarette? It worked incredibly well. But I think that if you're going to play dumb, you have to have established a rapport. Because these people, they don't have a lot of time. They have powerful jobs. They're like moving. And often what I feel is that it's better to um, show them that you're competent, that you know something about the, the, the subject, not that you're a know-it-all. And there's a huge difference. You know something, but there's so much you don't know. And you, know, you need to get them to help you 
you know? And so enlist them, you know, on your journey to help you understand by showing them that you have enough, but that you need them to help you. I always like to meet them where they're not comfortable, outside their workplace. They're much more likely to be a little bit free and easy. And consider, depending upon the person and, and you know, what's going on, consider laying out everything that you know. If you feel that this is a trustworthy source, that can be really valuable. But it's, it's a bit of a gamble. Okay. When you know someone has information and you really need it, I won't go into the details, but there's this one story we've been chasing for quite a while. We know a certain item exists. We know a lot about the item. We've been, but we, we need more. And we know certain people, or we're pretty damn sure, certain people know of it, you know. And if you know this, there's, if you know this, this is a crucial person that you absolutely have to get something from. It's more than just figuring out their motives. It's really figuring out the context in which they live and the waters in which they swim. You know, word, like, how do they speak? Can you word your questions in their vocabulary? I once did a story about an anti-gay, an anti-gay uh, marriage initiative in California and who was funding it, right? And so when I talked to the gay folks, I would say, um, you know, I'm writing a story about this proposition that would outlaw same-sex marriage. And when I called up these people who I had found through public records who had funded the anti-gay side, so these were people who were anti-LGBT, I would say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm calling uh, and I'm doing a story about traditional marriage. Right? Both things are true. I have not lied in any way. But I have worded my question in a way that the source will feel more comfortable and will talk with me. And sometimes that's learning different kinds of jargon. If you're talking to a scientist about whatever the scientist is an uh, expert in, the flu or HIV, you need to be able to speak their language. I like to bring, this is something, uh, uh, I like to bring something to show right? Sometimes it can be like the best thing is a public document, right? But you can bring, for example, an indictment where somebody has said something or a transcript from a court interview. Um, and I, I find that those things are incredibly helpful because you can sort of show it. Well, you know, for example, a flow chart. Well, I understand that the money went from point A to point B and it ended up at point E, but I don't understand C and D. And I think you know. So can you just help me here, right? And then they kind of have to look at it and it, 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 it causes them to just kind of think a little bit. It gives you an opening. It allows you to, again, establish a little bit of that rapport. And always bring a letter if they so that if they decline to talk, you can leave something. Um, if they have a document that you really want, but they won't give it to you, will they let you read it? Like, think about alternatives, okay? And the most important thing is if you need something, word your questions in a way where no is not an option. Do not say, would you give me that document? Because the minute they say no, they've locked themselves into no. And it's so much harder to get them from no to yes. But if you say, you know, how might I get that document? No is not really an answer to that question, right? So think about how to word your questions where no is not an option. Am I going over? If we okay, I'll be quick here. I hate this kind of interview, but the truth of the matter is we have to do it all the time because even in investigative reporting, we're often up against a deadline or what have you. Just Exactly as Cheryl said, say as little as possible and as neutrally as possible. You know, I'm a writer from BuzzFeed News and I'm doing a story about whatever. Um, and you probably know something about them, anything. 
look for any possible connection, whether it's the south side of Chicago, whether it's, you know, you once worked in a restaurant too, or whatever it is, look for anything where you can establish some point of connection. And talk about yourself. Like if all else fails, if silence fails, if you don't know anything, you can just talk for a little bit about yourself. I once knew a guy who worked for Vanity Fair who got all these celebrities to open up how they had been abused by ch as, as children by telling them this story about how he had been abused as a child. Like it is a, fun it is a way that can work. When you ask a question and you sense a bit of resistance, back off immediately. Talk about something else. Talk about the weather, it doesn't matter. Just talk about something else. Ten minutes later, circle back into that, to that sensitive area, but from a different angle. Uh, for a story I did here in South Africa, I, I did a story about these gangs who were at the center of the methamphetamine trade, and this one uh, gang leader, he, he would get skittish. And so I would just back off and have him talk about something else. And either, because I went back to him like 10 or 12 times, uh, I would bring it up the, second, the next time, or I would wait an hour in the conversation and then bring it up. So those are some things that you can, you can do if you sense resistance with an unknown source. So the confrontational interview, which we all do, we all have to do it. It's a critical part of what we do. You've, you've, you've really pretty much convinced yourself that this person or this entity is, has perpetrated some kind of harm or wrongdoing. Um, I think this is one of the most important things that we do. I think the way that we do it speaks to our integrity as journalists and our integrity as human beings. And even if I know someone is guilty, like I know it in my bones, I always remind myself that sometimes the only person who can prove they're innocent is the person who's accused of the crime. Like, no matter how sure I am, I always tell myself, I could be wrong. And I'm going to hear what this person has to say with an open mind and an open heart. And that brings us to the second point. Your goal is not to check off boxes. Yes, I asked him if he had, you know, beat his wife. You know, you're, you're, you're really trying to engage and to get their version of the story. You do not, you are not a prosecutor. Your job is not to say, didn't you do this, Mr. So-and-so? Your job is to get them to talk, you know? Well, you know, I don't know. I, some people have said that you did this. It just has such a different feel if you ask the question with a smile or, you know, in, in a way that doesn't feel confrontational. I, by the way, got this with a smile. I, I worked with, a, with an editor once who had been a AT&T telephone operator, and they were told to always answer the phone with a smile. Um, and I thought that was actually a really good way to do interviews. No matter what, keep calm. It does not help you to get in an argument with your source. And if they attack you personally, just remind them that you are doing them a favor. You are giving them a chance to say whatever they want, and you will treat them fairly. And if they won't talk, send what we call a no surprises letter. Because a person who reads your story can feel any emotion they want. They can feel fury. They can feel depression. They can feel elation. They can feel like they want to come and beat the crap out of you, but they cannot feel surprised. They should know what's going into your story so that they have a chance to respond. So when we send one of these letters, first of all, I edit them uh, because when the reporter sends them, I want to see them if it's a major story. We often lawyer them because you can do third-party libel if you ask a question about somebody else you can be libeling that somebody else. Um, and we lay out everything. At this, this is sort of not, when we're nearing publication, we lay out everything. And it is amazing when people get these letters how often, no matter how many times you have asked them, that suddenly when they see this letter, they will finally talk with you.
So it's not just that you're checking your ethical box, yes, I told them what we were going to say, and they, therefore they have no right to be surprised, but you're, it's also a great tool to get people um, to talk. Those are basically my, my, my points. I want to add one other. Um, I have what I call the rule of three, which sometimes gets expanded to the rule of 30. But my basic feeling is that someone doesn't want to talk if they tell me to my face three times that they don't want to talk. If they tell me over the phone, that doesn't count. If they tell me on email, that doesn't count. I will go knock on their door. I will sometimes stake out their house and follow them to their place of work if they haven't spoken to me at home, knock on their work door, but they have to tell me face to face three times that they don't want to talk and then, okay, they probably don't want to talk. Thank you very much. This is how you can reach me. Okay. So that was good. That was good. Will you show us? Okay. I don't know if this works. No, he's got a mic. He's bringing a mic. Is it working? Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I had was that, yes, it is totally about human interaction. Um, and it's often quite difficult when you're then writing down your conversation or even recording it, so people shut down because it's hard to have a conversation and also be writing what's being said. So any clever tips on how you make someone feel comfortable whilst also writing down what they're saying or at what point to be recording the conversation or how to bring up that you're about to be recording the conversation? Well, if... That's why I think interviewing in person is so important because if you're in their surroundings, you can talk about things in the room that you see, like maybe there's pictures of family members, right? And you can get them talking about that. That puts them at ease. Or once I was um, interviewing a, a, a county attorney and he like had a thing for old cars and he had some pictures on the wall and I talked about that and, and I'm sure this wasn't the reason he turned over the documents, but he turned over those documents. Um, but it made him feel more comfortable because it's like, oh, she suddenly cares about who I am and, and, and what I think. And so that's, that's what works for me. It's a little harder over the phone, but I also play, I'm a sorority girl, so I play that sorority card like with when I'm dealing with a, a African-American female, college educated, there's a chance that they might be in a sorority. And, and that usually works if they are. Sometimes they're not my sorority, and then I kind of make fun of it, and it kind of like, you know, sort of breaks the ice. So again, I think, though, it goes back to either the commonality or finding, if you're in person, finding something in the room that you can talk about and get the person to talking. And the only other thing I'd say is that they know you're a journalist. They expect you to take notes, you know? I mean. There's a way like, you know, you can take notes, like kind of still looking at the person. In fact, most of the time looking at the person. Um, and in, in for, the, for the tape recorder, it can be more uh, difficult. But one of the things you can, one of my sort of standard lines was, do you mind if I tape this so I get it accurate, right? Um, or if you really feel the source is defensive, say, listen, I'm happy to give you a copy of the tape. The one thing I don't do is, particularly with people who aren't media savvy, I never go into an interview and pull out that notebook right away, right? Because it's like, whoa. Um, and then with the recording thing, I will, I, I don't record interviews. I've had, I've had bad luck recording interviews because sometimes you're sort of like trying to take notes and record and you, you think you've hit the record button and you get back and you hit the play button and you've got nothing. So I use a tape recorder sort of as a backup, but I am a note, I'm a note taker, but I will wait. I will start a conversation maybe about something on the walls and then I will pull out my notebook as they are sort of responding to that and then start taking notes because Mark's right. They expect you to take notes. It's what we do. Rusana had a question. 
Oh. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you very much, both of you. Um, I have a feeling that more and more often I feel that it's a struggle when it comes to the role I have um, in regard to to the relationship with the person I want to interview, because this person, especially, for example, when dealing with right-wing extremists, uh, they have their own platforms, uh, maybe even uh, quite big alternative media sites and media platforms, and this um, kind of pre-interview talk uh, where you try to, to engage them and get them into this human interaction gets so much more dangerous, because they might make a story of you just a minute after you um, like uh, say goodbye. So, so how do you prepare for interviews on those occasions? So I think that's a great question. And the establishing rapport is not always the best way. So for example, we did a, a story about um, the main funder of the American racist right, that we called it the most famous racist you've never heard of. Um, hmm. And uh, we didn't try to, um, uh, you know, uh, build a kind of rapport in that way, but rather we said, listen, you know, you've, first of all, it's very difficult to get an interview with him, but with many of the other, we did eventually, but with many of the other uh, racists who were around him, it was, listen, you know, we're not going to pretend that we share your point of view, but this is a chance to have your ideas in some way, shape, or form out there. And, you know, we are going to treat you fairly, right? And it's really important to know, not just when speaking with people who have their own blogs or websites or very sophisticated media, but even now when you're talking to corporations, that they may very well create their own um, uh, their own story about you. And so it's important always to kind of like conduct yourself as if you are also being recorded, which is, goes back to sort of being honest and all that kind of stuff. But I wouldn't try, I wouldn't try to pretend you're something that you're not, because that will not, they'll see through that first of all in two seconds, and it, and it just won't work. Much better to think about this one just in pure, pure interest. It's in their interest to reach people that their media doesn't reach. Yeah. Mark's exactly right. That's, that's a case where I go into an interview and say, thank you so much for meeting with me and get to the questions, get in and get out, right? And, and, and really don't add anything that they could use against you. You know, that's when you don't make the small talk, I think, right? And just keep it on point. Hi, Cheryl. This is Arun from Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, there are so many cases of missing persons. It's it, because of the three decades war. Recently, they set up a office for missing person. But my question is that we are not, we journalists want to produce new stories with 360 angle from covering the other side of the, but if we interview only the victims, if we don't get a response from the other side, can we still go ahead with the story without the only the side of the bringing out emotions can do? We can, I can find several victims, but is that enough, only one side? So, so your question is, can you, can you run with the story if you only have the side of like the family? What other side, well, you could get the side of law enforcement, right, to say, you could always get, you, there's, always, there's always another side, right? Maybe how many missing people there are and you know, when this all started and why. You could do like some background stuff. Will law enforcement not talk? They don't, they don't talk. God, I'm glad I live in America. I so, and sometimes, um, because I, I listen to your struggles and it's, it's not easy being a journalist um, in, in some places, um, but I, I, don't, I would think you'd need more, unless it's a story about that one particular person, then I would think if you've got family members, I don't know, can you do, you could do a profile maybe, but you still need to balance it out. So I'm gonna let Mark. Yeah, and I think 
what you did is you found a case that had been adjudicated in court and that the killer was known to, you know, the cr killer had been found guilty. In your case, I don't know Sri Lanka. We did actually have a great story out of Sri Lanka from, from my team in BuzzFeed, but I d unfortunately did not, was not able to go to Sri Lanka. But I would challenge whether really you can't get law enforcement to talk. I mean, you know, can you, first of all, is there, is there somebody who, used to be in law enforcement, a former head of the police department who you could approach and sort of build up trust with him or her and then get uh, she or he to, to make uh, connections to you to people inside the force. Can you uh, go to the bars where the cops hang out and befriend them? I mean, is there a way in that maybe uh, hasn't been tried to get to get the police to talk to you about it. And maybe and, the family. Maybe yeah. the family's dealt with law and, enforcement and, and they, they may know. And they someone. Like, yes, this was the police or this was the person who killed my, mm -hmm. if it was a missing mm -hmm. person, this is the person who did this to, to my son or my brother. And then you can go and knock on that person's door and at least you've given that person a chance to respond. Or maybe there's paper somewhere in government that, you know, a death certificate or something that would add credence to what the family tells you. Never assume that people won't talk to you. You have to make that effort, and you have to make that effort more than once. Um, for those of you who came to my session yesterday on ABCs, um, I, I had a hospital president who I gave him seven chances to talk, seven, and I put in the story that I gave him seven chances, and then wrote him a letter too, and he wouldn't talk. You can't make people talk, but you can give them a chance, so don't ever assume that law enforcement won't talk just because you know government is a certain way, because I think there's always somebody willing to talk somewhere. Um, I'm Shirley from Taiwan. I have a question. Uh, thank you first. Uh, nowadays that I feel more and more interviewees, they uh, smart, that they don't want their name on, on report. So uh, do you have any policy about anonymous interview? We don't use anonymous sources at the post. We will say someone close to the matter or someone familiar with, and it's usually more than one person too because one person's source, the credibility is just not there. Uh, but no, we don't ever use, you know, I, and, I tell my, and I tell my students, don't, if you can't get their first and last name, find somebody else. You know, you got to. Oh, you mean if, if it's a case where they don't know the, the identity of the person? Oh, they don't know the identity. Is that what you're asking? Um, no, I, I mean the interviewees, they don't want to put their name on the story. Oh, that's they what I thought. Yeah. yeah, they don't want to be, they just don't want to be named. Find somebody who does, you know, they, and yeah, it's just, I just think it's about credibility because credibility is all we have as journalists and, and so I think you can find somebody else. Mark? I'm actually going to respectfully disagree. You can do that. That's <laughs> why we're here. It's a democracy. <laughs> I think that sometimes you can't find people. Like, you know, we do, we're doing a lot of stories now that, you know, where we're dealing with people in intelligence and that kind of thing, and, and mm -hmm. it's very, very, very dubious. We don't, you know, we, we, we try to cross-check and cor corroborate what they say, but in many cases, the people could lose their job if they, they could even go to jail if they're, if they're found out. And, there's only a small number of people who have the information. And so in those cases, you have to weigh, you have to do two things. You have to make sure you've really tried to corroborate what they're saying through documents or other sources. And then you have to weigh, like, is this something that you believe is, is, is more or less true? And second of all, is it important enough that you're going to go forth with a story that's based largely on anonymous sources. It's and a very hard call. And the other thing I think you could do is try to convince them to go on the record at some point. Try to convince them, maybe not that day, right, but come back to them and maybe in a week and say, okay, you know, have you thought about this? Can you think about this? And, and why it's important to have their name out there. It might work, it might not, but, you know, you never know. Um, Shira, um, just um, mm -hmm. on what you just said now, um, that you can go back to them. I just, um, you know, after weeks of getting, and it was actually a great story, I thought. Um, so I got, I went to the business premises of this guy that he didn't want to speak to anyone. So he said, okay, come in, I'll speak. And then he told me the whole story. And then afterwards he told me, but you can't print that, that was all off the record. Mm -hmm. I was so <laughs> angry. There's a rule. 
if you don't say it up front that it's off the record, it's on the record. That's my that's my thinking because I will too. yeah, because people like that are savvy. They know and and they can once I identify myself as a reporter for a particular publication and I say I'm doing a story on X, Y, and Z. It is on the record. But we don't even have to say it's on the record. It is on the record. But he told me the entire story. And I was thinking, like, you know, yeah, thinking I've got this amazing story. And now you tell me, but, but was, probably during the interview, he probably changed his mind or something. Was, but I think I'll, I'll go back to him and uh, maybe try. Was he a public official? No, no, no. Oh, he's a private citizen? Pr a private person, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 happened to, that happened to me, and Mark's probably, I don't know if Mark's had that happen to him, but that happened to me once. I had this amazing interview with this drug-addicted doctor, right? And he was great, and he told me about how he stole the drugs from his, it was his big box of candy, and he stole it, and he, and he stole drugs from the children he was supposed to treat, and he replaced it with saline. It was this amazing interview. And then, again, I don't know whether he sobered up or went back on drugs, but he called me and said, I'm sorry, like, is this going to be in the paper? <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah. And, and, he, and then he just, like, freaked out, and, and he, got ups he got really, like, angry. And he says, well, do you know who my brother is? And I said, well, no, do you know who my brother is? I'm like, dude, like, what's up with this? And, but it turns out, legally, we could not use that information because he was a private citizen. The lawyers, the Washington Post lawyer says, you can't do it. And so what we could use, though, we could use public documents. So we found the executive editor at the time, Lynn Downey, said, find some public records on him. So I found public records, and we found a photo of him. So we used that. So that really ticked him off, because he didn't know we had a photo. But it was in a public document. So we used that. But we couldn't use all those amazing quotes he gave us, because he was a private citizen. And he decided that um, he didn't want his name or he didn't want to be quoted in the paper, which is why when I do an interview, I try to be thorough because I don't want to have to go back to these private citizens who may change their minds if you call them back and go, you know, I've had a change of heart. I don't want to be in this story. And then you're, you know, screwed. Hello, uh, Eva Jung, journalist with Danish newspaper Berlingske. So, Mark, I found your uh, rule about um, not accepting the source, uh, saying no until you've asked them three times uh face to face so i don't think uh that would work for me uh, so i'm very interested in hearing did ev anyone say yes the third time and why do you think they did that so the one that was the one that was the most fun was um we did the story on so medicare is the united states government's insurance policy for people who are 65 or older it's Billions and billions and billions of dollars. And we were doing a story about these fraudulent doctors. So I went to this uh, woman's house. She was a doctor who was basically had defrauded the government of $11 million in one year. And I went to knock on her door, and she wasn't there. But then she sort of peered out from a back fence and wouldn't talk to me. And I came back, and I talked to her husband. And her husband was like, well, no, she doesn't want to talk with you. And I said something to the effect of like, you know, she, she, yeah, she works at which clinic? Hoping he would tell me and he didn't. And so I staked her out, which is a thing I like to do, actually follow people if they won't tell me where they work. I do that a lot or where they live or whatever. Um, and followed this person to um, her place of work and showed up and gave my card to the, to the receptionist. And and to my total surprise, and I will never know why, I was told to go meet her in an exam room. And so when I got into the exam room, I sat on that little thing where if you're a patient, you sit on it, you know, the thing with the paper on the sort of thing that you lie back down on? The table. Yeah, so that she would sort of feel that I was a patient and she was the doctor. And she walked in and she said to me, why do you keep harassing me? You don't know anything about my life. I said, so tell me. <laughs> and so she started telling me about her husband and everything. And I, you know, half an hour later, I began to move the conversation into what I wanted to, to talk about. She had told me no, I think at least twice before I actually finally got to her. Um, and, you know, obviously you can't do that for everybody. These are sources you really feel you need to get, right? But, and it's also different culturally in the United Kingdom, for example. If someone tells you not to knock on their door again and you do so, it can be harassment. 
So the way we get around this is we wait until we have some new piece of information so that we can credibly claim that we're not harassing them but giving them an opportunity to respond to something new. Um, so it's culturally dependent. Um, but yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, hi, uh, I'm Milica Šarić. I work for Center for Investigative Journalism of Serbia. Uh, we mostly oh. do investigative stories, sorry, uh, and that means that we talk to people that are uh, reluctant sources or that are uh, officials, state officials, etc. But when we talk to people that are really upset, like that uh, woman that lost her son, she was really upset and she got really emotional and she got crying. So my question for Cheryl is, when do you stop the interview? When do you stop the interview? When do you stop the interview? Yeah. That's a that's a that's a that's a difficult question, but not so much too. I think when you've gotten the information that you want that you came for, but I always let the person have the last word as well too, because they may add something that you didn't think to ask that could be pertinent. Um, and so that's when I, you know, I, I, because I write down my questions and, you know, we're having a conversation, but I make sure I get all my questions in. And then when I'm sort of done, I let them sort of take over. And then when they're done, we're. I, f I mean, I felt bad that she lost her son. Um, d did I mind that she was. Cr no, I wanted her to. I, want, I wanted that interview to be as real and as raw as possible. And it wasn't the questions that I asked that made her cry. There's a difference, right? It's like, oh, she's being the mean reporter. She said, no, it's like this came from her. This was her emotion. This was her, her raw emotion. And so, no, I didn't. I felt for her, but I didn't feel, I didn't feel badly that she, if that makes sense, that, you know, I mean, no, she was being real. Um, can I say one more thing about interviewing that, that when Mark was responding that when somebody agrees to an interview, do it then. Don't wait. Don't wait. I have, it happened to me recently. Um, I have been trying to find this family for months um, for this unsolved homicide case and I finally tracked down a sister who gave me the name. She said, well, one of the other sisters speaks for the family. Here's her number. And so I figured I'll call her later that day or the next day because she gave me the number. I figured the next morning at 7 o'clock, I got a text message from the sister I had contacted who said, we've talked about it, and we decided that we really don't want to talk about it. And I kicked myself because I thought, if I had called that sister right after I hung up the phone, I probably would have had the interview. So I texted her back, and I said, I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, I'm hoping that you will change your mind. Thank you. And she sent me a text back that said, you're welcome. So I'm going to call the other sister, but I'm giving them some time. But it was my fault. So when somebody agrees to an interview, really try to do it Try to do it then. I just want to. I should want to add one other thing, if you just don't mind. So I, I yeah, I'll, a bit quick. On vulnerable people, it's important to not, you know, put them through some kind of emotional trauma. But it's also important not to patronize them. They might want to tell that story, painful though it might be. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm struggling. Tip sheets. I just want people to forget tip sheets. Hi, I'm struggling with the contradiction in the advice, what building a report, and, um, oh, but then also using awkward silences. You're trying to make somebody comfortable, but then you're making them uncomfortable. Do you use that for confrontational interviews, or how do you balance that? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. You, hmm. you know, I kind of do it subconsciously. So it's hard for me to say. Um, I don't think, I probably use it more for the human, you know, dealing with the families than I do with like public officials. Because with public officials, I just, you know, I'm here, I, I've got questions I need answered. It's l less of a, con it's still a conversation, but it's less of a conversation with those people than it is with the people who are less media savvy. So, I, but I do it sort of subconsciously, that awkward silence thing. You know, sometimes you get a sense that someone hasn't really told you everything. And then you just let it hang, right? You, and, and you can also lean into the awkwardness. Look, interviewing someone is awkward. It's socially weird. You walked up to somebody who just 
got, you know, watched a shooting or, you know, whatever. It's, and you want to, like, ask them these really intrusive questions. It's going to be awkward. You have the advantage that you know it's awkward. And you can lean into that awkwardness and not be as uncomfortable as they are while still kind of finding moments to kind of like reestablish or, or reconnect with the person. And it is an art that you get sort of better at the more you do it. And these are not, like you don't always use silence and you don't always build a rapport and you don't always, but these are sort of common tactics that you can deploy at the moment that your instincts tell you it will work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. Yeah.